We're going to get uh, started. So it's our pleasure to have uh, Christine Stawitz uh, today here with us. Uh, she's a stock assessment modeler at uh, NOAA Fisheries. And like many of us and many of our speakers in this series, uh, is uh, you got her PhD from the University of Washington and, uh, and then uh, did a postdoc at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center with Andre Punt and, um, and Buck Sucksausen. Right. So uh, we really look forward to this talk. So um, go ahead, Christine. Okay. Thank you, Joseph. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me to give this seminar. Um, it's going to, um, I'm going to start with some work I did as part of my PhD at University of Washington, where I worked with Tim Essington, and then move on to some preliminary results from an analysis I'm doing, revisiting some of the same data, looking at changes in growth. Um, so as we all may be aware, there are, are a lot of fluctuations that we see whenever we look at the record of fish catches or fish populations. And in a closed population, when we see these fluctuations in abundance and biomass, um, we know that they must be caused um, in the absence of um, migration or immigration by changes in the th key demographic rates that govern populations, namely those of reproduction, um, mortality, and growth. And I know forever we've talked about recruitment and fluctuations in recruitment and why, how those drive changes in fish populations and what those consequences mean for management. Um, however, I think just recently we're starting to focus more on changes in somatic growth and mortality and how do we measure and predict those and better understand fish populations. Um, and I'm going to talk about somatic growth because that's what my work has focused on um, and try and con I, I don't think I need to convince people here that growth fluctuates because of uh, how variable halibut growth has been. Um, but talk about how we measure those fluctuations um, and try and draw inference about perhaps why they're occurring. Um, so um, recent work from my PhD that I'm not really going to talk about today has focused on making the point that variation in growth can affect populations, um, both in sort of a very simple population dynamics application which um, we talked about in this Journal of Animal Ecology paper that came out this year, where I looked at eight different ground fish species um, across the Northeast Pacific. Oh yeah, it's kind of loud, huh? Okay, thank you. That's probably better. Um, <laughs> the, oh yeah, so I looked at eight different ground fish populations and found that in four of them, so Petrali, Sol, um, halibut, canary rockfish, and Pacific cod. Um, the magnitude of growth variation shifts that we saw were actually enough to make larger shifts in the biomass of the population than the, the recruitment variation exhibited by these species over the same time. And then um, in one species, West Coast Petrali sole, I looked at how those changes in growth could affect um, estimates of management reference points used in stock assessment and showed that if there was evidence that the size of fish was varying and that wasn't accounted for in the model, you could come up with biased um, management estimates. And so it was important to take those consider the variation into account to avoid that bias. But today I'm going to talk a little bit more about what changes in growth are, how we detect them, and ways of using um, patterns that we see to identify um, how growth varies and why growth varies. And to do that, I think we need to really think about all of the different mechanisms that can drive changes in fish size that we might see in observational data, which is what we often have. We often don't have repeated measurements of the same fish um, to say that you know, we can just conclusively say what's causing changes in growth. Um, and so there are a lot of different things that can drive changes in fish size that we see in observational data. The one I think we often think about first and most often is changes in food supply. And food supply in an ecosystem changes as a result of 
um, two primary drivers. Um, the first can be through changes in primary productivity that drive the total um, changes in the total amount of food in the system during times of high or low production. And the second is competition, whether this be with conspecifics or other species in the same ecosystem. If there's more mouths to feed, there'll be less food to go around. Of course, fish are also ectotherms, and as we can see in this graphic of two phases of the El Nino Southern Oscillation, there's a lot of variation in temperature, spatially and temporally in the ocean. And so metabolic processes are going to increase in periods of warmer waters or places where there's warmer waters and decrease um, when it's colder. And so this can affect growth as well. I think it's also important to consider that there are factors influencing the size of fish that we see in observational data, even if they're not necessarily biological changes in growth. And I'm going to call these top-down effects. Um, the two main top-down effects that I'm going to talk about operate in size-selective ways, but opposing ways. And so fishing is size-selective for larger and faster-growing fish. And so if we see if we're observing changes in size in a heavily fish population, um, we could see that the largest, fastest growing individuals are not in the population during times of high heavy fishing pressure because they've all been removed. Similarly, if we're using fisheries data, we might have a biased sample where the fish that are caught by the fishery are larger and fast, more faster growing than average. Um, conversely, predation tends to operate in a size-selective way, in the opposite way, where smaller individuals are more subject to predation-induced mortality. And so if there's a lot of um, pred predation on a species, then we might see the smaller and lowest-growing individuals removed first as they're eaten by predators. And we lately, we're thinking a lot about how to understand and project changes to fisheries um, due to climate. And so I just want to point out that of all those factors that influence the size of fish that we see, you know, there's really only half the picture is caused by the environment um, through temperature effects and through changes in primary productivity. Whereas the other, the other factors influencing growth could be caused by density dependence, fishing, or predation. And so how do we disentangle these effects? Um, back when I started working on growth, uh, the folks I was working with hypothesized that if changes were due to environmentally driven changes, then we might see a synchronized response in the growth rates or the size of fish across different species within an ecosystem. And this might be a way for us to say um, more confidently that these changes were environmentally driven rather than driven by one of these many other factors. Of course, there's other alternative hypotheses for this. Um, so we could also see in our data that every species was doing its own thing. And so there were no shared um, changes or patterns in size at age across different species within an ecosystem. It could also be that there was some sort of shared pattern within fish in an ecosystem, but that the degree of sampling, quote unquote, noise that we have when looking at this observational data is stronger than the pattern that we observe. And there are really two key types of sampling noise I'm gonna talk about today. Um, the first would be um, changes in sampling over time and space, things like size selectivity, where is sampled, um, gears, uh, changes in gear, et cetera, as well as bias sampling like from a fishery, as well as spatial variation. Um, in this case, because we were looking for um, environmental change on a temporal scale, we are treating spatial variation as noise in the first, first study I'm going to talk about. Um, and so first I'm going to talk about a way that we looked at um, quantifying the amount and type of variation in size at age using state space models across 40 different ground fish species in three large marine ecosystems. Um, in the map, you'll see over here, the Eastern Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands is colored in brown, the Gulf of Alaska is in blue, and the California current is in yellow. So a state-space model framework essentially allows you to model a biological process of interest. Um, in this case, the one that we were interested in was changes in mean length at age 
over time. And so this is what you can think of as kind of, if you could go out and sample every fish in the population and know its true length and then take an average, um, it would be described by this mean length um, term. However, we can't do that. Instead, we get these flawed sample mean lengths that are taken from a subset of the population and are subject to all sorts of effects that can occur um, due to sampling error. And so from these flawed observations, we can draw inference about the true population process of interest, the mean length of the fish. Um, first, we modeled four alternative process equations to identify the scale of growth variation. And so I'm gonna talk about those four alternative hypotheses for how growth varied across the population scale. Um, and I'm gonna use these kind of caricature charts to do that. Um, so on the left, I guess, yeah, your left, um, the graph has length at age on the x-axis and length at the subsequent age on the y-axis. And so this is kind of that yearly growth rate. And then the graph on the right has um, time in years on the x-axis and then mean length on the y-axis. And so if there was no growth variability, what we would expect the true biological um, length at age to look like, we would expect there to be a constant growth rate over time. So any, at any point or um, in a fish's life, if you find where it is at a length at a specific age, you could just look at the length it would be at the next stage and you would predict the same, same growth rate from age to age plus one at any point. If you took an average of fish of different ages, so age three or age four shown here in black and gray, you would expect basically a flat line and there might be some bouncing around. Um, so it wouldn't be a perfectly straight line if there was just some random variability around the mean. And you can contrast that with a model in which mostly early life history effects are what's driving these changes in size, and we called this initial size variability. So this is when at recruitment or at a young age, um, the fish sort of had either good or bad nursery conditions. And so it started off its life at age three, which let's say that's the recruitment to the fishery of this hypothetical fish. It's either smaller on average in that first year, or it's larger on average because it had, you know, a better or worse growth rate when it was young. And then these effects, might be expected to persist um, throughout its life. And so fish that start off small would always be small as they age, whereas fish that start off big just continue to be big. Um, we also looked at cohort variability. And so this is a little bit tricky to disentangle from initial size variability. Um, but the main difference is that we assume that fish are basically about the same size at recruitment. So as you can see in this age three line, the mean size at age is constant over time. But then how they grow in subsequent years is dependent on their birth year. And this might be something you'd expect to see if there was really strong density dependent effects in a population in years where there was a stronger weak year class. And so for example, if you had about an average size year class, you might be on this orange growth rate line um, for fish that were born in 1991. Let's say in the year class 1992 is a little bit smaller and so all individuals born in that year could kind of grow faster. Um, then you might expect them to have an increased growth rate as compared with fish that were born in 1993. Finally, we, the fourth type of variability we hypothesized was annual variability. And this is when a fish of all ages either have increased or de decreased growth rate at the same time period. Um, and so you would expect to see here that instead of the growth rate being driven by birth year as it was in the previous image on this left-hand graph, it's instead determined by the year that it is right now. And so if you're an age two fish in year 1993 or an age four fish in age 1993, you would grow on the, according to the yellow line um, and similarly for other years. And how this would look if you looked at mean length at age data on this other graph, 
would be that you would basically see parallel lines where across all ages, you would either see all fish are kind of smaller than average at a given time period or all fish are kind of bigger than average in a given time period. Okay, and so those were all referring to this process part of the ob part of the state space model. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the observation part of the state space model. Um, one of the benefits of state space models is that you can incorporate multiple sources of data into multiple observation equations that all inform your true biological process or growth rate. And so this is beneficial because it means you can incorporate covariates that affect sampling that would not affect the actual growth of the fish. And the covariates we used here um, were gear type, um, age method, um, depth, and latitude and longitude. And so we incorporated those covariates into our state space models and for as many fish for every fish, we try to incorporate as many data sources as possible. So for some species of ground fish that we analyzed, we only had survey data or we only had fishery data. But for other species, we had data from both a summer and a winter fishery that often had different fleet dynamics. And so they could be modeled as separate processes with separate um, sampling covariates. And then a scientific survey, which hopefully would have less observation error. But this framework says essentially, if you see a blip in the winter and the summer fishery, but you don't see it in the survey, then that might be due to changes in fishing regulations. And so it helps the model distinguish between what is sampling error and what is a true change in growth that would be, we would expect to see mirrored across all the different data, data types. Okay, so first I talked about the different um, population scales of growth variation. So I'll show you the results in the percentage of model um, selection weight given to each of these four model types across each of the ecosystems, um, where again, we have four alternative types of growth variation, the constant, annual, cohort, and initial size variation. Um, so across all of the ecosystems, we actually saw that the annual variation in size was the most commonly chosen by model selection with initial size variation being a close second. If we break it out by ecosystem, the Bering Sea and Aleutian Island ecosystem was the only one for which those initial size effects were um, chosen in a larger percentage of species. Um, whereas for the California current and Bar um, Gulf of Alaska ecosystem, the annual scale of growth variation was chosen more often by model selection. Okay, so what did these types of estimated trends look like? I'll show you this now, the graphic, um, the x-axis is year, the y-axis is a normalized difference from mean length at age. And the lines represent the median and the shaded regions represent the 95% credible interval. Um, so for four species, including Pacific halibut, there was a noticeable trend. And I define trend to mean there was kind of a distinct increase or decrease that was persistent over the time series that we observed. And then for nine of our um, species, like walleye pollock, so more of these, we didn't actually see a consistent increase in growth over time or decrease in growth over time. Instead, we saw kind of these fluctuations around the long-term mean. And so there, there were periods of smaller sizes and periods of larger sizes, um, but no trend over time. Okay, so coming back to our different hypotheses for growth, um, what we definitely saw that there were species specific changes in growth in um, a large minority of the species that we looked at. So there's definitely evidence that time, size at age was varying over time. Um, and so it could be that, but we didn't see a lot of shared patterns between different species. And so it could be that that means as I said in the beginning, each species is doing its own thing. There's individual factors that are influencing different fish of different life history types differently. 
However, it could also be that there are shared patterns in size at age and the noise caused by aggregating data over such a large spatial scale was obfuscating the patterns um, that we might see if we could account for the, some of those um, changes in spatial sampling um, or spatial growth patterns over time. And so I really, after I did this, I was kind of unsatisfied saying that there were no shared patterns over time. And I thought maybe if we could look at it spatially, we might see more shared patterns across species um, within an ecosystem. And so we chose to limit our initial uh, data set from the first analysis to look more specifically at the Eastern Bering Sea ecosystem. And we chose the Eastern Bering Sea because this had the longest time series of good survey data and ages going back. Um, and we looked at six different species that had been in our initial analysis um, that, again, had some of the best, best data. And they were all kind of, even though I have the whole Eastern Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands highlighted there, these are really mostly Eastern Bering Sea species. So they're all living in the same ecosystem. Um, for this spatial analysis, unlike the previous analysis, we needed to limit the number of ages that we could look at. And because we'd seen primarily those annual or initial size effects that were persistent throughout the fish's age, and we looked at, again, all the different ages coming out of the survey, the different length of age coming out of the survey and saw that they were all very highly correlated with each other, such that each age was clearly following the species trajectory. We just chose the age of fish with the largest sample size for this analysis. And so this meant um, for some species, we had younger fish, um, Pacific cod, northern rock sole, and flathead sole. We analyzed the length at age four, um, Pollock and arrowtooth flounder. We looked at length at age five, and yellowfin sole, we looked at age seven. Um, and in this case, we only looked at survey data. We did not look at commercial data as well. Okay, and so we first fit a single species model to each of these four, um, well, a suite of single species models to each of these six um, species. Um, so the length of age data span 1982 to 2017 from the Eastern Bering Sea Groundfish Survey. And so we fit two different types of spatial or spatial temporal covariation. Um, to each of the species that we looked at. Um, and then we also included different environmental covariates, including sampling depth and sampling temperature for each of the, the analyzed species. And these were fit within the um, VAST R package, the vector autoregressive spatiotemporal models. Um, I should have put references here to the other papers that have been published on it, but there's been a lot of those methods have been published in a lot of other places, so I won't go into them here. Okay, so when we looked at single species analysis, spatial temporal analyses, um, there were some di species specific differences of which model was the best one selected by model selection as gauged by AICC. Um, so for Pollock and Cod, the best model was one that included both spatial and spatiotemporal covariation, but no environmental covariates, so depth and temperature did not seem to have an effect. Um, for arrowtooth and yellowfin flounder, the best model included only spatial covariation, so no spatial temporal covariation, but also a depth effect. For flathead sole, the best model included spatiotemporal covariation and temperature. And for northern rock sole, the best model included spatial temporal covariation and depth. And when I took out the extracted trends in length and age and just did a really simple correlation, there did appear to be some significant correlations between the growth trend of different species. Um, so Pacific cod and Pollock had a significant positive correlation. And Pollock and yellowfin had a specific up significant um, positive correlation. And then 
um, flathead sole had a significant negative correlation with both Pacific cod and walleye pollock growth trajectories. And so we took this to be, this was sort of the first phase in our analysis where we wanted to look at species specific trends and see if there was enough evidence to model this in a multi-species analysis. And so because we saw some shared patterns in size at age, namely that um, Pacific cod pollock yellowfin had a shared pattern and flathead sole um, seemed to have a negative correlation with that same pattern. Um, there was evidence that were, there were shared trends and there were also evidence that there were species specific changes in growth for two of the species that we looked at, um, Northern rock sole and um, arachis flounder. Okay. And so we took the four species that had seemed to have shared trends and put them into a multi-species analysis. Um, so this was also done in the R bass package that um, Jim Thorson and others have worked on. Um, so we used a spatial dynamic factor analysis to do model selection between one and four shared factors. And um, I've not yet gotten to the point of incorporating covariates into this multi-species analysis, um, but that's something we want to do in the future, both for environmental effects and den density. Um, so next I'm going to show you the spatial patterns in size at age that came out of that multi-species analysis. Okay, so this is walleye pollock. Um, the scale here is in log length at age, um, going from smaller sizes in blue up to the warmer colors uh, represent larger sizes at a specific age. In this case, I think it was age seven. And so what you can see here is that there is definitely temp both spatial and temporal patterns in size at age of walleye pollock. Um, and there's a lot of spatial variation, namely across all years, fish tend to be smaller in the kind of northern um, western quadrant of the eastern Bering Sea. And then at age, they tend to be larger when you move to the south and more inshore. Um, you're probably familiar with the Eastern Bering Sea, but the shelf edge kind of extends out this way. And so Pollock seem to be larger in shallower, more inshore waters at age. Now Pacific Cod looked very different. So the first thing you'll probably notice is compared to Pollock where you kind of always have those red and blue colors on the map in the same year, showing that there's a lot of spatial variation. Pollock uh, cod seem to have more temporal variation and that there are some years like 1990, 1992 and 1993 where kind of across the whole spatial domain fish are smaller than average. And then in more recent years, kind of across the whole spatial domain, they tend to be a little bit larger on average. Um, and they have the exact, maybe not the exact opposite, but a very different spatial pattern than Pollock where the larger cod tend to be found more offshore at the edge of the shelf um, and sometimes more um, towards the north in this sort of outer shelf region. Looking at yellowfin sole, again, there is probably more um, spatial variation than we saw in Pacific cod. So there's, again, quite a few years where you see both pretty cool and pretty warm colors occurring, suggesting that there's a large spatial gradient in growth. And yellowfin as well tend to be larger across as you move out towards the Aleutians and the shelf edge, but more towards the southern region of the shelf edge rather than the northern region of the shelf edge like Pacific cod. And flathead sole, the final species that we looked at, had a pattern that was maybe a little bit similar to pollock. So again, there's a lot of spatial variation um, where you see both really large and small fish in the same year. Um, but fish tend to be much smaller as you move to the north and tend to be larger um, kind of in the inshore, um, I guess, I don't know what that peninsula is called, you guys probably do, but whatever this <laughs> peninsula is. 
Um, so more inshore into the south, flathead sole tend to be tend to be larger. Um, so what does this mean if we actually, after we account for spatial variation, are there actual uh, shared changes in size across time between these four species? And there actually were um, between three of the three of the species that we looked at. And so Pacific cod is shown in the pink, Wally Pollock is shown in the light brown, and yellowfin sole is shown in kind of the light green here. And I'm not showing flathead sole yet. The x-axis is a year and the y-axis is the prediction of the scaled length at age, um, trying to get all the fish on the same scale. And so you can see there's still a lot of noise, but there definitely are shared patterns in that all there is this period in the late 80s, early 90s, when all three of these species tended to have smaller on average length. Whereas in recent years, like since 2005, again, there's some noise. And in very recent years, Pollock seem to be going up, whereas Pacific cod and yellowfin are going down. But there, again, there seem to be kind of more positive um, length trends in more recent years. And so once you account for those different spatial patterns by species, there you are starting to see some shared trends in length at age, although there's still quite a bit of random variability. Flathead sole actually had the almost the opposite trend as those first three species. And so you can see in that period I mentioned earlier of the late 80s to early 90s, when the first three species tend to be smaller than average, flathead sole tend to be a little bit larger than average. And similarly, in recent years, when the first three species of hull had um, scaled lengths that were kind of over, over zero, flathead sole tended to have negative um, effects on length. So it could be that these four species are responding to the same driver, but that it has the opposite response effect on the growth of flathead sole than it does on the growth of the first three species. Okay, so that was a lot. So in summary, um, there did appear to be shared trends over time amongst Pollock, Pacific Cod, and Yellowfin Sole in the Eastern Bering Sea. However, the spatial patterns were quite different and there was a lot more spatial variability in some species like Pollock and a lot more temporal variability in others like Pacific Cod. And just to put them all next to each other, I just picked out the year 2011, which was a year in which the first three species I mentioned tended to have kind of larger than average growth and flathead sole tended to have on average um, smaller than average growth. So you could see just how different those uh, spatial patterns were. So the largest fish of each species are kind of never in the same place at the same time. And so going back to those hypotheses for growth change, um, in the Eastern Bering Sea spatial analysis, it did seem like that spatial noise, which in the, the sampling noise, which in this case is really spatial noise, that we saw was obfuscating these shared temporal patterns in size at age, which we did see across three of the three of the stocks that we looked at. However, there were also species-specific changes. So I kind of removed arrowtooth flounder and northern rock sole and then never talk about them again, but they seem to be doing their own thing. And I don't know if that's because, you know, they tended to be more data poor than the other ones. And so they just had more noise or if they really are responding to a different um, driver when looking at growth change. And so what does this mean for identifying shared trends in growth? Um, so going back to the first analysis, we saw that the trends in growth tended to be shared either annually across all ages within a population or amongst the um, initial size, so kind of that size at recruitment effect that then, went, then would persist through the fish's life. And even though we corrected for sampling effects as much as we could in that first analysis, we did not see shared patterns in those annual or initial size effects um, that were really distinctive in that first analysis. And that could be because when we looked at it spatially, 
we saw that there was a lot of spatial variation in size, but that each species was had its own kind of spatial pattern in size that was different. And so I think I still need to do the work to actually look at any correlations between density environmental covariates and those spatial and temporal patterns in the second analysis. But my hunch is that there are definitely shared I think that the drivers in this case are multi, multi-factor, multi-fold, where there could be environmental influences that are causing some of those shared temporal trends that I showed, but then there also could be um, density-specific factors that are driving some of those spatial differences. And the one that I really think, just looking at the output, is Pollock, because we know that there are a lot more Pollock as you move offshore and it's kind of counterintuitive that a fish would be smaller in inshore shallower waters and I think that that could be because the concentration of the pollock biomass is further offshore and so those fish that are further offshore are subject to more density dependent effects on growth and that's why they tend to be smaller and so we need to keep looking at it um, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge all of my um, collaborators and funding sources on this work, and I'd be happy to take any questions, both from people here and people online. Great, thanks very much, Christine. That was very interesting. So the floor is open for questions. Ian, I'll go first. Um, so if I'm understanding, when you did the VAST model mm -hmm. and then you, you boil that down to a pre prediction, that would essentially be a density weighted prediction because you're modeling the density surface of length at age. I'm trying to get my head around what's the difference between the, raw, the naive estimate uh -huh. and the VAST estimate and why yeah. the pattern got so sharp. Yeah. Um density weighted so it's not I mean I'm not putting density into the vast model at all I mean it's so do you mean density weighted just in the source the fact that you have more more observations from a specific spatial point yeah I'm wondering if yeah. it, which which one is truer to the sampling yeah. design in terms of right the number of fish sampled compared to the number of fish that were in a particular area yeah um i mean i guess by the first is also somewhat area weighted and that you know we just aggregated the fish across all different spaces so whatever um wherever you caught more fish there would be so i guess yeah so i guess it's the first analysis could have been tracking changes in size over time, but also changes in sampling area over time that were then looked like changes in growth. Whereas the second one, the random effect of the spatial, the spatiotemporal random effect is fit first before the fixed effect of the length variation is estimated. And so those spatial differences are integrated out prior to estimating the temporal effect. And so yeah, I think it's that the I think it's that the second one takes more into account that the effect of changes over time across the whole spatial domain while integrating out that spatial temp spatial covariation whereas the first one could also be misattributing changes in sampling location to changes in temporal size at age. And I did actually look at this um, I tried doing the same sort of thing, just looking at the raw data and not integrating out the, the spatiotemporal covariation and the patterns were much stronger after you integrate out the, the spatial covariation. Mm -hmm. Was your age data to disinfect God all from all the visually read age data that we use in like length of it's all otolith. Um, the type of otolith read it is changes at 
some point over the course of the data set, um, which is what we accounted for in that first analysis. So we used proportion, the covariate that we used were proportion of ages that were read using break and burn versus surface aging techniques. Um, from 1982 to 2017. Okay. Yeah, so the first the first analysis we looked at, um, we did try to account for that. Again, it wasn't perfect, but because we didn't want to throw out all the scale or surface ages, um, so we just mod we just added a covariate of the percentage of, um, and I have a graph somewhere where that shows the percentage of scale versus break and burn versus surface otolith reads over time. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, none none of them are length age um, derived. They're all they're all from reads of something, whether it be an otolith or a scale. Yeah. I've got a question, and, yeah. and that is, um, you mentioned that uh, the. Uh, initial size effects uh, as well as annual effects were the most prominent ones, but uh, those um, initial size effects, are those linked to specific life history characteristics of species? No, it's just the the size at the first age in which we had good sampling coverage of the species. And so it's not, it's not based on, I mean, in some ways it is loosely based on recruitment because you tend to get better samples after they recruit. So um, I guess it's loosely related to um, age at recruitment, but um, yeah. And, and another question that, that's not related to specifically what you told us here, but uh, I was interested in seeing, learning about your opinion, how, for instance, reproductive investment is contemplated in in your estimates of growth variability, um, mm -hmm. you know, particularly those species that uh, uh, show evidence of skip spawning, for instance. Where, yeah. Um, so what's what's your idea? Um, it's not, and I think it's an important thing that we often don't model jointly, and I think there's a lot that needs to be, there's work that needs to be done on what the joint distribution of investment into size and recruitment is. Um, I did look at in that, the paper that I very briefly referenced at the beginning, which is the effect, predicting the effect of somatic growth variation on populations. I did include a kind of synergistic term such that in years of high growth, you had a little bit more energy to allocate towards recruitment as well and varied that factor from um, to see if that made a large impact on the results and it actually didn't make that big of an impact on the results so the, the four species that had the larger impact of growth variation were still dominated by growth even when their recruitment subsequently increased in those you know years of plenty where you might expect a fish to have more energy to invest into both but of course it could go the opposite way where if you invest more into length and you don't invest it into recruitment so i don't think that there's I think that's something we really need a lot more research on is how those covariate. Yeah. I'm kind of curious. Um, I don't know too much about this stuff when it comes to fisheries, but I'm wondering, um, is there any evidence to show um, kind of uh, somatic growth rates of some of these fish based on, you mentioned top-down effects. So is there a greater impact from top-down effect based on anthropogenic impacts like fishing pressure versus actual predation top-down effect? So hierarchy in the food web. I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, I have never actually looked at 
growth in forage fish. I'm starting to right now for the first time, but I think that would be really interesting because, you know, the ground fish species I'm looking at tend to not be the ones that are really getting predated on quite as hard as compared to something like a sardine or an anchovy. Um, I do think there are a lot of, again, it's kind of a hunch, but I think when you do have years where um, there's heavy exploitation in the ecosystem, there are some trends that I've seen that seem consistent with a top-down effect of fishing, um, namely in a lot of the California current rockfish and some of the California current flatfish species during the period prior to the collapse of those fisheries and the disaster of the West Coast groundfish fishery, there is a depression in the average size at age that I think is likely because all of those large individuals were fished out. Um, that said, all of them that I've looked at seem to be rebounding in recent years. And so I think it is a, an effect of selective fishing removals, just removing larger individuals and not a fisheries induced evolutionary effect where you know, we expect them to stay small. They seem to be coming back um, from that from that pressure. But I've never seen I've never seen an effect of predation. But I would be interested in looking at different types of populations, like forage fish, just to look at that more. Ian. So the maps when you showed for each species the the time series maps, mm -hmm. and some of them are remarkably stable, and other ones clearly jump around year to year. You're, you're actually modeling length on those maps, not yes. length increment or... Just mean length at, the, at a given age. Length at age. Yeah. So because you're not working in the increment, then they, they've got to be auto-correlated over time. Mm -hmm. And so could you not sort of reverse, could, could you infer movement rates based mm. on how stable those are over time. It seems like some of those patterns you can't explain without moving fish around and others look like really stable population. Yeah, you could, and I've never used it, but I know there is a feature in VAS that's like predict range shift. And so you can turn that on where you are estimating. And you can also, I think in this case, I did not include it, but you can have auto correlation like an AR1 process in both the spatial temporal covariation and in the, the fixed effect of the, the growth trends. So it would be easy to look at that um, and see if it improves the fit or smooth things out a little bit in terms of, um, yeah, I think I've tried putting the AR1 process on the, on the fixed effect of the sort of the mean growth in each year, but I haven't looked at doing it in the spatiotemporal covariation piece, and that would be interesting if that would have that effect, because you're right, it could be that they're moving. Do you have any questions online? <laughs> you focused on the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands on the last part of your talk, but I um, was wondering if you did any work on, in particular, cod in the Gulf of Alaska with the, and how the sudden drop off in their population numbers would affect the 2016 and 2017 values. Yeah, no, I have not looked at the Gulf data, although I will as part of a different analysis soon. Um, but yeah, that'd be that'd be really interesting. Um, yeah, I've not yet though. Well, thanks very much. Thank Steve. you. Thanks for an interesting seminar.